Elite Dangerous is set to receive its next big expansion later this year. And with it comes a heap of improvements, new gameplay features, and of course, an influx of new players. While Frontier Developments has significantly improved the new player experience over the years, it still has a steep learning curve that can be a bit daunting. If you want an example of this, in the early days of the game, there was no in-game tutorial beyond a handful of YouTube videos that could be viewed within the game. At most, players received a Welcome to the Galaxy pilot, here's your teeny tiny spaceship, followed by the proverbial light tap on the arse telling you to get the f*** out of the spaceport. Well, they didn't exactly say that, but you get the gist. From there, a confusing struggle ensues while you try to get a foothold on the game, often resulting in death by trial and error, a lot of debt, and a numerous amount of game save restarts. I have been playing Elite Dangerous off and on since 2015, and there are a few things that I discovered in the last few months of playing that I wish I knew when I started my journey. So in this video series, I'm going to share those things with you, in the hopes of making that learning curve a little easier so you can get to enjoy the game in the same way that I do today. To some degree, there is an elitist attitude, pun intentional, about the correct way to play the game. That attitude being that if you're playing with anything other than a keyboarded mouse or fly using a docking computer or a super cruise assist, you are a terrible player and a terrible commander. If I'm completely honest, that is a pretty shit attitude to have because it only serves to deter new players from checking out an otherwise solid space flight simulator. When I first started my career in Elite Dangerous, I found it difficult to use the mouse and keyboard controls game, coming from games like Freelancer that I had many hours in. I found that I would move the mouse a little too much and my ship would wobble around, making it hard to control. I would also hit things, resulting in hull damage and eventually death and frustration. So the very next day, I purchased an Xbox 360 controller and I've used it for a majority of my time playing the game. Towards the end of 2020, I finally taught myself how to play Elite Dangerous using mouse and keyboard because I wanted to play on my breaks at work via Steam Remote Play. And now, it's my preferred method for playing the game, or at least until I get my hands on a dedicated HOTAS peripheral. Elite Dangerous supports a variety of different input methods, such as gamepad controllers, HOTAS flight sticks, and mouse and keyboard to pilot your ship. To some extent, some control methods are better than others in certain aspects of the game. For example, keyboard and mouse is said to be the meta within the PvP community because it allows for quicker responses and more agile maneuvers while in combat. But if PvP isn't your thing, does it really matter what you're flying with? My point in all of this, don't let anyone dictate to you what you should play the game with or tell you that you're a bad pilot because you play with a particular input method. Play how you want, enjoy the game, and fly your own way. Most spaceports in the galaxy of Elite Dangerous will have mission boards, where players can accept tasks given to them by various faction representatives with presence in that system. One of the pitfalls that ensnares new players is the lucrative offer of rewards for what seems like little effort, right up until you begin your prep work for the mission and become aware of some of the details that may have you reconsidering to take that mission. For example, an NPC gives you a mission that is simply delivering data from one starport to another, with a juicy 5 million credit reward. Except that delivery location is in excess of a few thousand light years away. For whatever reason, the mission gets trashed and you're left with a pissed off NPC faction and potentially a fine or even a bounty on your head. Much like any sort of agreement, it is important to review all of the details before accepting. Let's break down the mission interface. Each mission will have an icon a fancy title that gives you a vague idea about the, what the mission is, the choice of rewards, and the name and distance of the location you'll go to for completion. When you open the mission, you'll be presented with more details about the mission. Take note of anything that may cause an issue for you, such as if the mission is illegal or if hostiles will be sent after you. If all looks good, then click accept and be on your merry way. The main piece of advice here is to make sure that you're checking the mission requirements before you click accept. The reward might look juicy, 
but make sure that you're willing to see it through to the end. There is enough variance in the mission types to keep you busy while space trucking through the universe, but it is important to make sure that you're taking the right missions or the missions that you're able to complete. Another pitfall for new players is that some missions will look the same at a glance, but on closer inspection, they have two entirely different mission parameters in order to complete the mission. For example, there are a handful of missions that fit into the Deliver This to X category. You have Courier Jobs, Delivery Jobs, and Source and Deliver Jobs. Let's break these down. Courier missions are the easiest of the three. When you take a mission, you are given some important data to transport from one station to another. That data doesn't use any space in your cargo hold because the item is stored in your ship's computer. You could effectively fill up your entire mission log with courier job missions and not spend a solitary credit on cargo rack modules. Now delivery job missions are like courier job missions, but these require physical cargo space. You'll often be asked to transport a large quantity of a single item such as food, medicine or weapons. The size of your cargo hold will determine how many items you can load onto your ship and thus will dictate how many round trips it will take to complete. Out of the three, the mission that trips up players the most is the source and deliver job missions. In this mission type, you'll need to find a station that is selling a particular commodity, fly there to buy the required amount, and then transport it to the mission destination. Not only do you need to have the required cargo space in your ship, but you'll also need to front the credits for the item to purchase the cargo. Finding the best price for an item may often be more effort than the reward is worth, such as having to fly over 500 light years from the location. Which brings us to our next bit of advice. During the initial tutorial within the Pilots Federation, you are taught how to plot a basic course from your current location, but it doesn't teach you any more than the bare basics of plotting a course. When setting a course to your destination, you can drill down to the location by going further into the various menus on the galaxy map. This means that when you depart from your current position, all you need to focus on is the travel and getting there safely, which as a new pilot is essential while you're still learning. Assuming that you have the galaxy map open and you know what system you want to go to, select the system and on the tooltip prompt, click on the far right icon that looks like planets orbiting a star. You can move the map around with your mouse by holding left click and dragging to pan. Hovering your cursor over the object will show you its name and left clicking on it will bring up the navigation tooltip menu. If it's a planet, you'll have an icon that looks like the dark side of a planet. Clicking on that will open up the surface view, at which point you can pan around until you see the planetary bases that are marked. For both orbital and planetary base types, click on the marker and select Plot Route from the tooltip menu. Then all you need to do is make sure that you've got enough fuel and you're set to go on your space road trip. One thing to note is that in order to bring up the system map, you'll need to have the astral navigational data. This can be acquired by scanning the navigation beacon the first time that you enter that system. Probably one of the most important and often said pieces of advice by veteran commanders in Elite Dangerous is the phrase, don't fly without rebuy. Your ship is valuable. If your ship is destroyed, you'll need to cough up enough credits to replace it, plus any of the modules and modifications, which can be a significant hit to your credit balance. If you don't have enough to cover the replacement, you'll have the option of taking out a loan. But the loan, however, isn't always going to cover the total cost of your ship, and you may still be required to cough up the difference after what the loan pays for. If after the loan you don't have enough credits to cover the replacement, your entire ship is forfeit. So there's a very good reason behind this phrase of advice, and it's to save you from a world of hurt. That's it for this video. Let me know in the comments if there's anything you'd like me to cover in the next video in this series, or if you have any questions about what I talked about in this one. If you found this helpful, hit the thumbs up button and share with your friends. Consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. 
I'm hoping to produce enough quality content this year to keep you all interested and hit a goal of a thousand subscribers by the end of 2021. And finally, a huge shout out to all my awesome patrons. Thank you all for your continued support as we make the transition from Twitch to YouTube. Stay safe, call your mum, and I'll see you in the next video.